Hi everybody, welcome to our Monday program, start of a brand new week and uh, hopefully you survived the alcohol ban. Uh, that of course was all part of this year's general election and we'll get on to that in just a moment. But we're crossing over to London first and coverage there from Kalsod English, their majesties, the King and Queen of Thailand attended a reception. Uh, that King Charles III hosted at Buckingham Palace. That happened on Friday. Let's uh, see some of the photos there with uh, King Charles III meeting with the King and Queen of Thailand. And there's their majesties at the reception. King Charles III crowned on the weekend. And there they are arriving at uh, the reception. That was on last Friday. And the picture's posted on the Kalsot English Facebook page. And let's go to our first story. The Thai government launches a public opinion poll on the departure tax. Now, I got some messages from people on the weekend who were all in a flurry about a new departure tax and the world was ending and uh, everything was crumbling. On the website of the Thai Revenue Department, a public hearing questionnaire has been launched to gather public opinion on a government departure tax of 1,000 baht. Okay, on the face of it, it looks like they're thinking about it. By the way, this is being reported by the Patianews.com. But uh, the questionnaire says the new levy will help prevent tourists from spending too much abroad. Really? And the hearing will range from May the 3rd to the 17th, aiming to assess a possible impact of the tax. But according to the questionnaire, Thai citizens and foreign permanent residents would be required to pay a departure tax of 1,000 baht uh, for air travel, 500 baht for land and sea travel. And this aims to generate extra revenue for the government and prevent Thai people from spending excessively overseas, according to the poll. It also aims to reduce the country's trade deficit. Well, that sounds right. Uh, just going to go into the public pot to pay the bills. But trying to uh, prevent Thai people from spending excessively overseas. The president of the Thai Travel Agents Association said the levy collection and its principle are unrealistic and illogical because Thailand's never encountered any issues related to a trade deficit in the tourism industry, given that 70% of the total income is generated from inbound tourism, while only 30% of the expenses are related to outbound tourism. He also said that a thousand baht is too expensive amid current economic conditions. And he said if the tax is ultimately implemented, Thailand's tourism would be affected as the numbers of outbound tourists would contract, resulting in imbalanced flows of people and causing difficulties for airlines planning flights to Thailand. This was the problem all the way along with the proposed arrival tax. Who was going to collect it? Well, the government said, well, the airlines can collect it. And the airline said, no, we fly planes. Uh, you do the taxation stuff. And the Thai government really haven't yet found a way to sort of separate easily um, the differences in passports because they don't want to impose it on Thai people or people with long stay visas here in Thailand. The same with the departure tax. If you want to leave foreign tourists out of it, how are you going to exclude them? So I think the collection is again the problem. But this is not even a proposal at this stage, it's just a survey. But people were getting all lemon lipped and thinking that it was going to be imposed. So the Bangkok Post reported yesterday a departure tax, just an opinion survey. It will not be imposed. And the controversy about a thousand baht departure tax on outbound ties and foreign residents is only a legally obliged opinion survey and the tax will not be imposed according to the Revenue Department. And the Deputy Director General of the Department said yesterday the Department did not plan to impose the departure tax of a thousand baht for outbound flights. 500 baht for exit by land or sea, he referred to a 1983 executive decree concerning the departure tax. He said that although a ministerial regulation has waived the departure tax since 1991, the constitution required the department to assess the suitability of the old executive decree. And he said again, there is not a plan to collect the departure tax. He said by the end of next year, the department would also conduct opinion surveys on laws on inheritance tax and petroleum tax. So I, I think for now, that's the end of it. They're, it's just a, a survey that they're legally required to do. So settle down, everybody. Uh, we've still got to worry about this arrival tax. 
that was going to start on June the 1st, but that's been pushed forward. They can't seem to work that out, so uh, I don't think you've got much to worry about any new departure tax. Now, the next video I'm about to show you it comes up quite quickly, so keep your eyes peeled on the road above. Here we go. And uh, we can see driving along Rama 2, and part of the, uh, the newly constructed road comes down on, uh, on top. Let's just have another quick look at that. So people driving along the road and a big chunk of concrete falls down on, uh, well, probably the people below. And ThaiPBSWorld.com reports that one dies, four cars damaged as concrete falls from an elevated expressway. And a construction worker was crushed to death and four cars were damaged yesterday when a huge concrete slab fell from the Rama 2 elevated expressway. So that Rama 2 road, uh, it's currently they're putting in tens of kilometres of this elevated expressway and it's uh, on the Rama 2 road which takes traffic out of Bangkok down through Samut Sakon down towards uh, the southern peninsula and the southern areas of Thailand. One driver said that he was approaching the accident at about 4.30pm. He heard something moving above, then a huge concrete slab gradually tilted and fell on the road surface. And another driver a bit further down there said he quickly swerved to avoid being hit by the falling slab. His car also sustained a cracked front windshield and a punctured tyre. He urged the expressway project contractor to be more responsible in ensuring safety for drivers and commuters travelling on Rama 2 Road. You reckon? Well, to say the very least, he also complained that about one hour after the accident, no related officials had arrived at the scene. And traffic police later closed the right lane of the outbound road while waiting for the contractor to bring in a crane to remove the slab. So that happened yesterday afternoon. You're watching TNT, a brand new week. Please subscribe to the channel if you get a quick moment. Maybe even click that like or even the dislike button if you like. Uh, and we should also thank Five Star Marine. If you're looking for a private premium charter from the island of Phuket out to any of the islands, I can highly recommend Five Star Marine. There's a link in the description below. You're watching TNT on Monday, and let's go to what was happening over the weekend with the pre-polling. The Bangkok Post reports that a busy day as the first votes cast. According to the Election Commission, some 2.3 million people registered for early voting nationwide yesterday, ahead of the May 14 election next week. And a bit further down there, the Bangkok governor said everything ran smoothly with only minor problems reported at polling stations, such as at Ram Kamang University, where some voters fainted due to the hot weather. People contacting me over the weekend saying it was bloody hot in uh, Bangkok. So still plenty of hot season uh, in some of those areas around central and northern Thailand. Although down here in the south, we've had a bit of rain over the weekend, just little showers, but certainly the wind was coming in from the west yesterday, heralding the start of the monsoon for this year. But back to this story, and the Election Commission Secretary General said the Election Commission received 92 complaints of election law violations, most of which had arisen in Bangkok and involved alleged vote buying. And he added that ballots cast by overseas voters have already been sent in by 68 Thai consulates, while the other 26 consulates are expected to send ballot boxes in the next three to five days, which mean they'll join all the ballots that are cast next Sunday. The polls will close at, uh, I think, at 6 p.m. on Sunday night, and we should have some indicative idea of who will be forming the next government by, say, 10 or 11 o'clock that night. That's next Sunday. And further to this story in Thai PBS World, saying big turnout at polling stations for advanced voting in Thailand's general election. We saw what was happening in Bangkok. Let's see what was happening in other parts of the country. In Chiang Mai province, advanced voting was held in 10 constituencies, with constituency one having 31,000 advanced voters. Many voters uh, here showed up before 8 a.m., obviously to avoid the heat. And in the three restive southern provinces of Yala, Patani and Naritawat, security is especially tight as a precaution against potential violence from southern insurgents. 
and thankfully none was reported. And further to the early polling, a probe by the Election Commission into unusually high number of advanced voters in three provinces. And Thailand's Election Commission is investigating a report of an unusually high number of advanced voters in three northeastern provinces of Amnat Charon, Yasaton and Sisaket, and alleged collection of ID cards from eligible voters, according to the Election Commission Secretary-General. He's been very busy over the weekend. He said the Election Commission was aware of such reports before they were disclosed by self-styled whistleblower Chuit Kamon Wissit yesterday and has ordered a probe, adding, however, that the election officials have to make sure that anyone who exposes alleged irregularities is protected. And further down there, he disclosed that advanced voting, which started yesterday across the country, has otherwise been proceeding smoothly. So that's really the dress rehearsal for next week. Now, there was an alcohol ban yesterday because of the pre-polling. That situation will be the same next week as well, when there'll be an alcohol ban from next Saturday night at 6pm through to Sunday at 6pm for the main polling day of May the 14th. Now you know. And uh, The Nation reporting that let there be light remote Korat villages to get electricity after 70 years. The story says for city dwellers, just 30 minutes of power outage can feel like the end of the world. Now, I have to say here in Phuket, I've been in this place for three years now, and I think we've had the power go out for a total of an hour, and it's only happened once, so I've had a pretty good run with uh, power here in Phuket. Yet there are some 300 people in a remote corner of Nakon Ratchasima, which is about a three-hour drive northeast of Bangkok. They've been living without electricity since their village was formed 70 years ago. We're talking about the Mu 16 village, and the village head said the village has some 86 households, and though they've been struggling without power for 70 years, not a single state agency has stepped in to help. Most children spend their evenings studying or reading with light provided by a kerosene lamp. Be a smelly way to do your uh, your homework. Clearly, television or even refrigerators are luxury items. Well, no power to run them anyway. And some families were able to invest 30 to 60,000 baht to install rooftop solar panels that generate enough electricity to power two electric fans and one small TV set. And the village temple, meanwhile, used to use a generator to provide light for special ceremonies like funerals or ordinations. So why, you'd think, is it such a problem to provide power for this village? Well, the story goes on to say the village head said the PEA had refused to provide electricity to the village because its location lies in areas covered by the Royal Thai Army's Animal Army Department and Quartermaster Department. Ah, that's the reason. And this would require the PEA to go through complicated procedures to receive permission from the two army departments. This would require the PEA to go through complicated procedures to receive permission from the two army departments before it can erect power poles. I think we're getting closer to the answer here. And I think he said it in this next paragraph. He said the main problem was the lack of coordination amongst government agencies. That sounds a lot more likely. And down the bottom there, but I believe the villagers will have electricity soon. Let's hope they do and the kids don't have to study by kerosene lamp anymore. And now crossing to Bali, this story from Coconuts Bali and covered in coconuts.co. And the Bali governor mulls putting a cap on tourist arrivals. The Bali governor has floated the idea of a quota system that would limit the number of travellers allowed to enter the island, citing concerns over misbehaving tourists. And he told reporters on Thursday that he was unhappy with the increasing number of tourists who flouted the rules and disrespected the local culture as Bali was recovering from the pandemic. He said, we will no longer welcome mass tourism. We will restrict tourist numbers by implementing a quota system. How is that going to work? Well, he explains. He explained that one possible quota system would require foreign tourists to register a year before they plan to visit Bali and wait for their turn to be granted entry. 
Like people are going to really plan a year ahead and they're going to wait until they're granted entry. He says if there's a quota, then people will have to queue. Those who want to come next year can sign up from now. That's the system we want to apply. And he singled out Russian tourists as the most problematic group in Bali, noting that 27 out of the 101 foreigners deported from the island since January were from Russia. Well, that, of course, correlates with the most numerous travellers to Bali during that time, which were Russian travellers. And down the bottom there, he says, if we let this go on, we'll only attract cheap tourists who maybe just eat nasi bunkus, which is a rice dish wrapped in banana leaves, rent motorbikes and break traffic laws, and lastly, steal from ATMs. I think he's being just a little bit dramatic. And that uh, particular quota system just simply won't work. I'd be very surprised if they implement it. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the Thai government doesn't think, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, it's just doomed to fail. Now, that's all we've got for today's program, a quick roundup of things happening in Thailand. Hopefully, you're a little bit more up to date. Please subscribe to the channel. Give us a tick on the way out. Hope you have a fantastic Monday, and we'll see you tomorrow.